So today I'm joined by Theo from Gallant Goblin. How are you, mate? Hey, Chris, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me today. No worries. I just want to talk about your channel. But before we do that, how, how are you after COVID? <laughs> well, it was my third round of COVID. Um, the, let's see, I don't even remember. The first time I caught it was the great Spider-Man pandemic of 2021, uh, when Spider-Man No Way Home came out and we decided we just brave it and wear a mask because we all wanted to see the movie and then uh, half the country caught COVID so that was the first time we caught it uh, and then the second time I caught it was at PaizoCon uh, 2022 uh, which was a sparsely attended convention out in Seattle but uh, apparently large enough to catch COVID at so that one hit me kind of hard uh, the PaizoCon COVID um, I don't blame Paizo for that, but that would hit me pretty hard. Uh, this one, we just went on vacation. We had a, a little cruise, my first cruise ever, and uh, caught it there, which is understandable because you're trapped on a you know relatively small ship with a couple of thousand people, so it was kind of inevitable. Um, but this one was uh, smooth. I, I got over it in about a week, so all good here and uh, back up and running and trying to catch up on all the channel stuff. Excellent. So yeah, I want to talk about your channel and obviously dig down into products and D and D and whatever, but um, yeah, twenty thousand, well over twenty thousand subscribers. I mean, you are kicking it hard over there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we've been plugging away at it for a couple years now. We it's been a slow build. We haven't had one of those moments where like a video goes viral and suddenly you double your subscription numbers the way some people have. But you know, we I think that we've kind of done it in a way that I'm happy with, where we. We try to avoid doing, you know, clickbaity titles and controversial opinions and hot takes and just try to provide uh, a consistent and reliable uh, stream of information and hopefully good advice and, and uh, help people know how to spend their money and just kind of grow a, a solid following that way. And uh, it's working for us and we're just happy to be able to contribute to the community and hopefully use our platform to raise up some other people who are just getting started. Uh, trying to you know be creator, uh, uh, content creators or writers or artists in the industry, and uh, use our platform for for that purpose as best we can. So what what made you start a channel? Well, um, originally we started in 2017, if I remember correctly, and we did it actually because my partner Grady uh, was an amateur filmmaker. And we had all this equipment around me, um, looking at all sorts of lights, and you can't see it on your side, but I have it over here. Uh, so we had all this equipment, and he had all this software, and uh, but he didn't have a team to help him make any films, because that's a hard thing to do all by yourself. So I thought, well, hey, we're just kind of getting into D&D now, and maybe we can just use our equipment and software to kind of just do a little D&D &D hobby YouTube channel. And it's an excuse for him to be able to practice uh, with all the stuff he's bought. So when the time comes around to actually make a film, he'll have a lot of practice with the equipment and the software. And so we actually kind of got into it for that reason. And also we were getting into mini collecting and there just weren't a lot of good resources out there for seeing, because they all came in blind boxes. You didn't know what you were going to get. And so there weren't a lot of ways to find out, like, what like, should I get this set of blind boxes or that one? Like, I don't know what's in them. I don't know how good they are. And then you get a lot of random things. You may not know how to use them. And so I thought, well, maybe we can do a channel where we really show them off and tell people how to use the ones they get and the lore behind them. And since that content is not there, maybe we can find fill that niche. And so that's kind of the, the short version of that story and how we got into it. Yeah, I think I discovered you 2018, maybe, uh, when I was looking for boxes of minis. I must have searched, I don't know, Icons of the Realm something, and that's how I discovered you. And uh, yeah, you, you recognizable channel. So obviously, when you when I see your face thumbnail pop up, pop up, I'm like, oh, let's have a look. You oh, know. Thank you. <laughs> so your your uh, thumbnails. I, I scrolled back to your as far as my phone would take me on your videos, and you know what? You consistent thumbnails. Now I know I'm getting a bit bogged down in. I'm interested in the YouTube thing myself. I'm like, yeah, he's been uh, had an art style, and you've kept it up. I mean, I watched one of your early videos, the first one I could find. And obviously I watched your recent ones and you pretty much nailed your style that early on. I, yeah, we, gosh, from the early days, maybe it's just we're resistant to change. Um, the one major change that we had along the way was uh, I started editing the videos instead of Grady a couple of months back. And so I started using a different software with different techniques. And so these days if you watch a video that stars Grady, you'll see that it's slightly differently edited, maybe different special effects and titles and things like that than the ones I do, because he still edits his own videos. 
Um, but that was the major, only major change we did, and kind of added a little title sequence halfway through, and yeah. a little bit of popping special effects because I was having fun with Final Cut Pro. But otherwise, it's been more or less similar. Hopefully, I've gotten a little bit more natural on camera over the years. Um, maybe tightened it up a little bit, added some music to keep it peppy. But uh, otherwise, yeah, um, we did change up the style of thumbnails. That was the one thing we did change too. Back way back when we first got started, the first year or two, we had relatively boring thumbnails, and then we were reading things like, "Oh, make sure your face is in the thumbnail because people want to see your face," and so we right. added that. Yeah. Is, are you scripted then? Are you reading a the script when you do it? Yes, unless it's an unboxing video. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, it's all scripted, and we have a teleprompter up there. Uh, it helps us keep it. I used to not do that, and it would take a lot more takes to make sure I got all the details right. And it would, um, you know, you would forget a detail here or there that you wanted to include. And so it just wasn't an efficient way of making the videos. So now they're all scripted. Sometimes I'll, you know, roam off the script a little bit when we're filming. But, but for the most part, you know, we just follow the teleprompter and um, try to make it seem as natural as possible. I write the script so I can make them sound like the way I would talk. And so that makes it a little easier. Yeah. I was hoping you were going to, well, I wondered if you are going to be filming in that same location. And I was going to ask about the products behind you in the normal video. You have so much. I mean, what, any favorites among those? Oh my gosh. Yeah, uh, we, off to the side here is, <laughs> I was just talking to Grady today that I need to do a spring cleaning. Um, there's, there's so much piled up in this room and the next, in the closet over here and the room back there. Um, and we're trying to catch up. I don't think we'll ever catch up on the things that we need to cover. Um, gosh, favorite things. Um, oh, there's just so many really fun things. I mean, to, we're playing a game this afternoon. I'm bringing in some new players, and we're going to run through a little Pathfinder one-shot. We're starting up our uh, some live play games coming up here uh, in the next month or two. And so we're trying to get a nice expanded cast. So we're bringing in some actors here in the community to basically audition to be on the show. And so that's what we're doing this afternoon. So I was able to bust out some Warlock tiles, uh, some Dwarven Forge, some of my old, uh, I think the Rusty Dragon Inn set, um, which has just been re-released by WizKids. Uh, yeah. To kind of set up a little, uh, we're using, I'm using the barrels and things to make a little warehouse on the table because they're, this is a little quest where they're going to come in and they're going to have to figure out why in the nation of Geb, which is an undead nation in the Pathfinder universe, uh, it's an undead nation that is also a great agricultural uh, industry and they provide the fruits and vegetables for much of that region because they have a lot of undead labor who doesn't really need to sleep. Um, and, but for some reason, a lot of the shipments have been going bad recently, and so you know they're they're going to be doing warehouse investigation. It's it's a little silly adventure, but I have a nice, cool like warehouse set up on my tables. So just I love having just those versatile things like the little buildings and the trees from Dwarven Forge and the Warlock Tile streets, and um, you can set up like little city festivals in the town. So those are the kind of things I just really enjoy setting up the little kind of dioramas this is yeah. little, at the school. Um, we have Onslaught over here, which is the new D&D board game that I have yet to open up. Um, the very cool Beetle and Grimm sets are always fun. If oh, you, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, if you happen to be running one of those, we have Spelljammer here and uh, Dragonlance. That I'm hoping to do a Dragonlance review soon. I have yet to be able to run an adventure using uh, any of their stuff. Like I have it all, but I've never had the timing work out where I'm actually able to use their stuff. Yeah. So yeah, that's, a, that's one thing about doing this content creation is we have a whole bunch of stuff that we never get to actually use in the way it's intended. <laughs> one of my questions was pretty much, do you think you will ever get to play with all the toys you know that you want? It's amazing how little I actually get to play these days. Yeah. Part of the curse of being a content creator is that you feel like you're not uh, allowed to enjoy the hobby unless it's in some way creating Work. content yeah um and so i've been trying to get back into it a little bit we're gonna start you know live streaming a, a campaign of the outlaws of alcon star soon so that'll give me an excuse to play a little bit more often uh we also have a member of our community who's gonna gm another adventure that we're gonna run on the channel here coming up soon and i'll get to be a player in that and so i very rarely get to be a player so i'm looking forward to that too to just sit down and be able to just not have to worry about gathering all the equipment. I just get to play a character. So that's yeah. going to be a fun diversion for me. I don't get to do that hardly at all. But yeah, so many toys and I don't get to use them too often. Mm. So do you prefer Pathfinder? Because that's what I seem to pick up this afternoon. Um, These days, I think so. Um, 
I think Pathfinder is a good next step game to D&D. If you play D&D for a good long time and you're ready for something that might offer a little bit more complexity, but the trade-off for that is that you have a nice big playground in which to create characters and tell stories that uh, D&D doesn't necessarily facilitate. So while there's more rules, those rules allow you to make really specialized characters that can tell a story both with role-playing and the game mechanics. Hmm. Um, in D and I, I like to say that your one fifth level paladin is not all that different from another fifth level paladin. But in Pathfinder, once you get past like second or third level, your character is probably going to be very unique, based on all the ancestries and classes and subclasses and versatile heritages. If you want to be a half orc, half vampire, uh, you can totally do that, and um, the mechanics will reflect that in your gameplay. And so it's just. I, I kind of like having that um, complexity in my game. And I also like the lore of Pathfinder. Just, there's so much, like D&D, especially in 5th edition, there's not a ton of lore about the world. So just, they don't do lore books so often. Mm. You know, we have adventures and we have books for other settings. You know, they're doing Dragonlance and everything. But we have like one lore book for the Forgotten Realms and the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, like yeah. what, day 17 or something. And there hasn't really been one since then and no. so it's just like there's not a lot of lore to build on at least in fifth edition i know there's a, you know decades of novels and things like that but um it's not super accessible anymore so i like that about pathfinder and also we just work pretty closely with the folks over at paizo um grady is uh they just announced the new uh set of books uh, the tianjia world guide and character uh guide and uh, a new adventure and uh, grady is a writer on all of those uh, he's a contributing writer, and so we've just kind of gotten close with the folks at Paizo, and wow. uh, so that's been really nice, too, just to kind of get into that little community, which is really great, and uh, work with them. So we, we're kind of close to Paizo in that way, too, but we're still playing all of them. I still have a Storm King Thunder campaign that I'm running, yeah. so we're still dabbling in everything. Yeah, that, that brings me to like, the whole WizKids thing. Do you have some sort of uh, a deal? How are you getting sent all these things? Have you, how did that come about? You know, you, you, you start YouTube one day. And then next thing you know, WizKids and that knocking on your door. Yeah, uh, that was facilitated by the kind folks over at minisgallery.com, uh, which is the, I think, the online home of D&D minis and, and role-playing minis. Uh, they've been around longer than we have, and they were a big resource to us when we were getting started. Uh, if you're looking for just reference materials for what is in all these mini sets from Pathfinder to Starfinder to D&D &D and everywhere in between. Uh, they have a great forum community, uh, very, very knowledgeable people about minis over there. And so we used them as we were getting started. Um, but yeah, we bought everything we reviewed for the first, I don't know, at least year. Uh, so it was a pretty big, uh, we spent a lot of money to kind of get started because we wanted to make a comprehensive video. So we would have to buy full cases of these minis to have one of everyone uh, to show off. And so um, we worked hard on that. And then eventually the Minis Gallery liked what we did and they knew the folks at WizKids and like, hey, you should uh, work with these people to, to make videos for, for them or for you. And so WizKids got in touch with us and um, the, the kind folks over there said like, yeah, you just keep making your videos. We'll just basically send you everything we make. Wow. And so we get uh, you know, pretty much every D&D, &D, Pathfinder and Starfinder thing that they produce. And we do our very best to uh, make videos for all the products. We don't usually, there's so many, especially these days, that we mm. don't get to make um, dedicated videos for every single thing anymore, uh, just because it's just the two of us and we're trying to do a lot. Um, yeah. But that's one reason we do the little unboxing videos. So even if a product doesn't get a full dedicated video to it, you can still sort of get a sense of what's coming out with our little unboxing videos. So um, yeah, that's kind of how that came about. We're super fortunate, lucky to, that, that we have a good partner over there to work with, and um, they've been very kind to us over the years. And Hit Point Press, what's the, are they a current um, sponsor or? They've been sponsoring us since we had, I want to say like a thousand subscribers. Yeah. They've been since almost the very beginning. They just again liked what we do, but like what we do over there. We uh, Ricardo over there. Um, just, I think, discovered us and said, like, hey, we'd like to, to help you guys out and sponsor you and support you. And we certainly wouldn't be here without them. Um, they've been a regular subscriber or a sponsor for us since, like, 2018. Mm. And so it's been really great because we love everything they make. 
Um, and I don't say that's because they pay us to, but we do actually, like, I, I was already super into Humblewood. Um, I had backed their very first campaign for their animated spell cards. Um, there was already so many products that we had brought in from them before we even got to know the people who worked there before they sponsored us. And they just, they get, they, they also help facilitate all these other really cool um, books like they did uh, Sina Una, which was a new adventuring campaign setting based on, based on pre-colonial Filipino mythology, which is amazing. And they do all sorts of really cool products like that. And so we're just very happy that we get to kind of share uh, all the things that they create. And it makes making ads so much easier when like, you, you, you th these are really cool products that yeah. I think our community would really enjoy. They're little big bad booklets. I have them all over the house. I'm trying to see if I have one handy here, and I don't see one actually at my desk right now. But um, I love the little big bad booklets just to have something to run when I, you know, when I need a little side mission or something. So yeah, we're super lucky to have them. So on the products front, right? I, I as I say, I bought icons of the realms and whatever. And like, like you sort of suggest, uh, I get the bricks so that you're getting as much, and it kind of works out the cheapest. If you, even if you do, you are buying more. You know, you're not getting too many duplicates, which I don't mind getting duplicates. Some of the paint jobs can be quite poor on some, and some are immaculate on the others. What's what's your views about quality? I think that has come a long way since. I think the turning point for Wiz Kids was the uh, what is that set called? Waterdeep Dragon High set. Um, and I remember talking to Patrick, who used to be the kind of head of marketing over at WizKids, or at least the, the head of the, the mini department over there. He's since moved on to another company. But uh, yeah, I, I, when we got the Waterdeep Dragon High set, I was like, these look so much better painted than the ones that came before. And he said, yeah, that was the turning point where they started a new process. Right. And I'm not... I, I, I think I'm a lot less picky than a lot of other, like, even viewers of our own channel. Because, you know, for most of these things, well, one, maybe my eyesight's not that great. Um, mm -hmm. But two, you know, functionally, like, on the table, it's, to me, it's like, it's hard to tell. You, you can't see all the details of the paint job anyway when you're using them in your games. So I can, and when we do our little videos, you know, we're taking these things that are, like, that big. And we're blowing them up, you know, like, a hundred times our normal size. So it's very easy to see the flaws and to wonder, like, why don't they have eyes that align or, you know... Why are their lips slightly askew? And it's like, yeah, but you know, they're really little. They're really little things. Yeah. Uh, so I have. I can't say that I've really noticed like any paint jobs recently that have disappointed me. There certainly have been some recently that wowed me. Like you occasionally get one. It's like, whoa, this one. They they really did a great job. Um, especially some of their premium painted minis. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I, the ones that I sometimes maybe have a problem on more than other, the little ones are just some of the very large creatures that have a very plain paint job that don't seem to have a lot of shading or a lot of highlights. And those are the ones where I might notice it a little bit more. Some of the dragons that just look a little bit dull and a little flat. It's like, I bet, I can imagine some people in our community could go and repaint these and do a much better job to make them look and like, stand out on the table. That's where I notice it in the big ones, I think. Yeah, yeah, I haven't had too many issues with the little ones. The little guys are normally leaning on nothing. They're all crooked. And that's, yeah. that bugs me. But yeah, you know, I still love miniatures. I, I just love things. But you, you were um, showing a paint set which had a little model in white paint. I didn't realise you could get them that actually came with the paint and the paint pot. I didn't know that. That's great. Yeah, that was one that came out with about two-ish years ago, the little paint night kits. And they were originally designed pre-COVID for game stores to have events at the store where they can oh, bring everybody in and do it. Everybody's painting the same mini and yeah. kind of work together and they have a video to show you how to do it and they do a step-by-step. -step. Um, yeah. But then COVID hit and so it was like, well, these events aren't going to happen. Uh, and so I think they eventually transitioned to just selling the kits and now you can just do it at home. Um, but yeah, no, those are good fun. Uh, our buddies at the um, Band of Badgers podcast and, and Twitch channel uh, do their little painting TV show, The Great British uh, Brush Off. And uh, I think they sometimes make use of those those boxes. Uh, I have one over here that was a Yeth Hound that I was just putting in my shelf over there. And I don't get to paint minis very often. This is one of those other things that I just don't get a chance to do unless I'm like on Dave's uh, Badger show. Um, but yeah, yeah those kind of kits are pretty great, especially the, the best thing about them is having that video to kind of paint, show you step by step some of the steps to painting minis, because painting minis, like, to a reasonable degree is not that hard. 
It's not yeah. that hard. No, I've been into Warhammer. I've, I've surprised myself looking at the things that I followed a video on and gone, you know what? That is really impressive. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can do some good work with some little, you know, using the little shading techniques and a little dry brushing. Like you can do some really cool things that maybe folks don't know is possible if they don't consider themselves like artistic. I don't consider myself artistic. And uh, like I've been pretty proud of some of my minis. Thank you very much. <laughs> and then the other day you showed the most magnificent Tarask model. It was just incredible. And it, it like, yeah, <laughs> it's like how many times can you pull that out of your game room, you know? Well, that's where you just like when you get these cool minis you just make it happen right yeah. like oh you open a box and there's a scroll of tarask summoning in there you know and whatever <laughs> adventure you're running and then just make it work um and that's certainly one that you probably don't want to pull out unless it's a very high level adventure yeah. but then you maybe like write a little adventure about a tarask you know it's an opportunity to explore you know it's some creative writing too like if you have a cool mini that you want to run, like design your own little one shot about it, yeah, or a, a little side mission where you incorporate it. Um, and we try to give you some lore in our videos to kind of maybe give you some seeds of ideas on how to bring them into your stories. Uh, and then you can also look at DM Guild. You know, DM Guild has quite a few. Like, there's that Tarask um, supplement that um, I'm forgetting the fellow's name who wrote it. Uh, I want to say Justice Ramon, but that's wrong. Um, but yeah, there's a, a very good little invasion from the planet of the Tarasks uh, adventure. So yeah, make it work. You want to use those things because they're super cool. So yeah, and also before I go to the next question, the, the little mimic colony, how cool was that? Oh, I know. Isn't that a cool one? I was just pulling yeah. have one mini sitting here. The, yeah. this, oh, I'm going to oh. drop them. Break them. Um, yeah, the mimic colony is amazing. And I... I that making that video is going to take me a while because I'm going to have to dig up the original furniture that they base those on because I think it comes yep. in a variety of Warlock tile sets. So I'm going to have to do the research and say, like, this particular cabinet is based on this particular cabinet from this obscure, you know, pack that they released in 2018. So that one's going to take me some work. Um, but yeah, this is a video that's coming out Monday for this creature, which is a pack. Okay. This is called a Mukrati, and this right. is sort of like a insectile Tiamat <laughs> in some oh. ways. Wow. It has like three different heads that are imbued with different elemental powers, and uh, it's a level fifteen creature. And it can just uh, if it gets a good hold on you with two of its heads, it'll just rip you in half. <laughs> um, and so yeah, it's not you know it's not the biggest mini in the world, but it's a very cool and different fight. And yeah. that's one other thing I like about Pathfinder a little bit more than D and D is that in D and D the stat blocks there's only so much you can do. Like maybe one creature will do radiant damage and another one will do necrotic damage but for the most part it's just you know hitting mm. you with an hammer or something and so yeah. the, the fights can only be so interesting but uh pathfinder with having larger expanded rules the fights can get a lot more interesting and the players have a lot more options on how they want to approach those fights so I, that's another thing i kind of like about it this makes the game a little bit more interesting when you get to those combat encounters because for me like the combat is not the main part of the game and sometimes i'll if a, if a fight isn't important to the story, I might just find a way to skip it. Because uh, I like the storytelling aspect of it. And so I don't want, you know, the, some wolves approach you as you're walking to the house. And so we're going to spend two hours fighting the wolves that don't have any story purpose. Like, that doesn't appeal to me as much. I know there's a lot of folks out there who really love the strategic, tactical battles. But I like just telling cool stories. So yeah. I try to keep the fights at a minimum sometimes. Yeah, I, I've got a question that I ask um, anyone who chat to, whether it's Kickstarter people or, you know, people like yourself. Let's blank slate, okay? You've got blank piece of paper in front of you, and I ask you to design a monster. Where would, where, where's your mind instinctively go? Is there a, an attack you think of, or do you think of a certain, you know, underwater or aberration? What's your favourite monster sort of thing? Uh, I, I do a little bit of writing, um... For some of the, you know some ventures, I have a couple of little supplements out there, and I I try to my mind goes to what are the themes of the story we're telling here, um, the themes or the, 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 the so in some way I want my monster to possibly be a little bit of a metaphor for whatever it is that we are whatever things we're exploring in our particular little adventure. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, you have, 
you know, the undead can be a very thematically interesting uh, element uh, for a fight. But that's kind of, I, I try to look into that and it's like, well, what maybe, what pre-existing category monster will fit into the, this kind of feeling or setting or mood that I want to uh, bring about here? Do I want it to be a, just a big cinematic battle that's just like a cool dinosaur fight? Or am I trying to get something creepy and that will, the players will just be, so scared that they don't really understand or know what's happening. Uh, the, there's a book that came out called The Dark Archive from Pathfinder that lays out some what x file Z kind of creatures that you can add to your adventures, cryptids they're called. And they're, you know, mysterious uh, creatures. You can alter stat blocks so that people, you can face familiar foes but maybe have different sorts of abilities because of some mutation or some augmentation that they've undergone. Uh, and so I like having also those unexpected moments in the combat. So I don't know if I go to any particular like, clad category of monster just when I'm thinking about it, but something that's related to whatever story we're telling, if that makes any sense. I don't yeah. know if I'm being very eloquent, but that's kind of what I try to go for. Fine, fine. So <laughs> uh, DM tips for new players. Have you got any advice or, you know, new business? Oh, I'm probably so much. Um, I think two of the things that I think are very helpful for new players. Uh, one, a lot of good storytelling and DMing is just being as familiar as you can be with your own setting. So if it's going to take place in a small town, like do your best to understand a little bit of the history of the town. What do the townsfolk do for a living? And what is their life like? Um, and so when, you know, someone goes up and talks to the barkeep or, you know, wants to, you know, go talk to the town mayor, if you have at least a sense of what that town is like and you can picture it in your mind, what does it smell like outside? What are people doing on a day-to-day -day basis? You can make that setting feel much more lived in. So, you know, rather than spending too much time just worrying about all the stories and plot changes and characters, just like get a good sense of your setting, first of all. And that'll help you in the middle of the play when the characters go off and turn left at an intersection instead of right the way you planned. Um, you'll be able to have an easier job coming up with what's going on. Uh, and then the other advice I like to give is um, a lot of new players have a hard time they, they fall out of storytelling and more, especially in the combat, they fall out of storytelling and more into mechanics. So they'll be like, uh, I attack, I roll a six, uh, I miss, uh, next player. Or, um, oh, I'm going to do a perception check and I, I rolled a 12. You know, and so you're not talking in game terms, you're just talking, mm -hmm. you're, you're talking mechanics terms instead of storytelling terms. And so the game master can set a good um, precedent by when a player's turn comes up, give them a little bit of a starting place. So if they're, you know, you can say, uh, all right, Bill, um, you know, let's say that Bill's character is a, a ranger named uh, Atticus. Like, Atticus is backed into a corner. He sees encroaching from the darkness three, maybe four zombies walking very slowly towards him. He knows he only has a moment before they're on him. What does he do? And so you kind of set the scene a little bit. So hopefully that player is then a little bit more in that character and they might be able to give back to you what you gave to them. And instead of saying he just draws his sword, he might, you know, be able to say like, he he very hesitantly reaches into his quiver and pulls out an arrow and shakingly holds it up to, you know, and kind of gives you that storytelling back. And I think that can enhance your stories a lot. So like just help your players get a little start with the storytelling. And also I think some players can be a little bit nervous about trying to act or role play yeah. so, so if you set this if you you know jump in there with both feet and show them that it's okay and it's acceptable and you're not it's nothing to be embarrassed about you can really kind of that the players will then feel a lot more comfortable and they'll have a model to go on to so i think those are the kind of things that i think help make a game get uh, off to a good start yeah so the future of your channel have you have you already met all your dreams and aspirations for this channel or have you got projections I mean, since we didn't really start this as something that was uh, YouTube goals, um, I don't necessarily have dreams for the channel even. You know, I never really, we were kind of hoping that eventually it would be able to help fund our hobby. I think yeah. that was kind of our only goal. And so, yeah, I think we kind of reached out once WizKids kind of helped us provide stuff. And now Wizards of the Coast and Paizo sends us things as well. And so, yeah, I mean, we kind of reached that goal of, of that. 
Um, I guess one thing that we did change is that uh, I gave up my full time job back in 2021, and so I'm trying to do this full time. And so I guess the dream now would just be to have it be a profitable enterprise where I can continue doing it full time and still be able to feed our cats. Uh, yeah. And so it's quite a big pay cut to go from you know the job I was doing to this. And yeah. so we're very much still trying to make it into a uh, a thing where oh I think my goal right now is to be able to hire a personal assistant like one more one employee who could just help me organize emails and calendars and uh, things that we need to get done because half my day now is just trying to make to do lists and calendars and uh, keep up with all that uh, and so I think. Uh, a lot of our goals are going to be around like these little guys that we started mm -hmm. doing. Um, we did a little Kickstarter and they're pretty. it was a pretty successful little Kickstarter. So we're going to start doing a convention tour this year. Um, yeah. Trying to you know get these guys out into their forever homes uh, at some of the conventions starting at Comic Palooza here in Houston uh, in May. And so hopefully we can go back to Kickstarter. We have a few Kickstarter plans for this year uh, to expand this line with some cool things. and. Um, maybe this is the because you know the YouTube money and the Hit Point Press money is not a lot of money. Yeah, you know, it's not necessarily paying the bills uh, so much. But hopefully these little fellows will help doing that. And uh, the other goal is just to try to continue. Like we have our Queer Finder supplement and a, a few of our other supplements that we're trying to do for D and D and Pathfinder. And because there's so many really talented writers and artists out there who have a hard time getting noticed. Yeah. And so, like having those and being able to continue those um, products, which take a lot of money to make because of all the art and everything we try to do in there. Um, but they have gotten people gigs, like freelancing gigs at Paizo. Some of the writers who did Queer Finder are now, including Grady, you know, doing freelance work for Paizo, which is their dream. So, using our platform to help other people meet their dreams, I think, is one of our big goals too. So, we're hoping to get Queer Finder issue two out the door here in the next month or two, and yeah. um, things like that. So, I think that's kind of where our goals are. I really appreciate the positivity that your channel is, your channel is actually bringing. You know, so thank you from all of us watching. Thank uh, you. Yeah. And, uh, and that's it. Thank you, Theo, and uh, continue with what you're doing. I really appreciate it, Chris. Thanks for having me on and letting me talk. Uh, doing these shows is a little bit like therapy. I get to come in here and just kind of talk about my life and what I'm going through. And then it feels like uh, a little therapy session. You always feel better at the end of it. Uh, so thank you for, uh, for doing that, my counselor. I, I really appreciate it.